Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, for the what we call uh, coronavirus webinar series at the Warsaw University of Technology uh, Business School. Uh, today, I'd like to uh, I'd like to invite you for the webinar titled "Trust in Digital Worlds," which is uh, a webinar uh, that will be run by uh, Achilles Georgi. And a um, few words, just a few words about uh, Achille. Um, he is uh, in Budapest at the moment, and he is the program director of Master of Science uh, in Technology Management and Innovation at the Department of economics and business in CEU and CEU stands for Central European University in Budapest. He also is also a senior lecturer um, of uh, digital transformation, leadership, sales and negotiations uh, related courses including our executive MBA program in our school. In, in Warsaw University of Technology. And he also worked for several international companies. Currently, uh, he is with IBM as the Technology Support Services Director. So, uh, many subjects, uh, but technology plus uh, leadership and and uh, sales related issues. And the, the title, Trust in Digital World. So that's from my side, just an introduction and Achille. Well, the screen, the screen is yours and uh, you know, enjoy everybody uh, for today afternoon. So. Th thank you, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this series of webinar you have. And that this is a hot topic, which from my perspective, I'm very interested in. So in, in some sense, during this couple of weeks, we have changed the digital transformation was boosted and we have changed more than what she transformed even more than what than the, the last year, 10 years, I would say. So in 10 weeks, we changed more than in 10 years. And uh, this is uh, more or less the topic which I would like to cover and how trust is embedded into this. <coughs> Thank you for the introduction. I don't have much to add to what you said. That this is the slide. The only thing I would like to say is that uh, I speak Greeklish. So those which you who have not met me before in your team, uh, that's my only negative. Uh, it's a challenge I cannot uh, change anyhow, but I hope you will understand. Uh, my general uh, scope of interest is our, about around technology evolution. And uh, how, how it's, what's the impact of this technology evolution in our business? But not only there, I'm very also curious and interested to, to explore. That's why with one of my colleagues, we call ourselves, we are info to, to explore how technology evolution has uh, impacted the, our society in general, and even on, down on individual level. So this is uh, uh, very my topic of interest. And uh, we do a lot of uh, discussions around this in, in the university. Uh, my personal objective with any presentation, any discussion which uh, I open is to make you remember at least one thing. So uh, you are, you are will spend with me one and a half an hour uh, and I, I, I'm very eager to, to make sure that you will remember at least one thing, to take something, take a, to have a takeaway which you can even apply or at, or at least make you think uh, in the following days. <clears throat> cool. So the, the transformation happens everywhere and uh, unfortunately or not, even this discussion has to be transformed in the form that we have to do it uh, online. This is my personal transformation. So in, on teaching also the, techno the COVID has forced us to move in the digital technology, to use more technology. Uh, in education and also in our presentations. I really enjoy to do a face-to-face, -face, but as you see, I, I take the challenge also with the technology. I have three, four monitors in front of me to make sure that you have all the experience, the ma maximum of the experience you can gain in such a form. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, maybe you can go mute, but if you have to add them, happy to add. And uh, generally, I would really encourage you to be active. So we, uh, I brought you a lot of questions during my presentation. Uh, I will give you also the possibility to express your uh, thoughts in a poll. We will use a system, but uh, I, we have plenty of time even to discuss. So please also do share your thoughts if you have any expectations. Uh, or questions during the presentation also I would be welcome. Uh, I have my, the chat in front of me, which I have uh, also, uh, I, it's visible. So if you, want, if you want to type there, you can type or just uh, stop me, talk and share your thoughts because I think by sharing your thoughts as well, we can learn even more. So that would be our ultimate goal. So during the presentation, uh, I will want to use a tool. I don't know if you are aware of this, just open a browser in your uh, any of the technologies you have in front of you. It can be even in a phone. And uh, just type in, I will put in the chat. I put it already, but I type it again just for those who are late. Uh, you can uh, open this uh, poll and there we will have, I will raise some questions during the presentation. Don't type, uh, don't answer the first question yet. It's active, but uh, I will let you know when you should answer the question and we will see the result on the fly in my slides. So this is a very good tool. I really enjoy it and like it because we can, it can bring the interaction uh, and also to, to add the, the, our common view together, the, those who are uh, joining this session. So the how we will go. So we, uh, my plan is to go through, uh, not to talk only about what happened during the last 10 weeks, because obviously you have lived through and you have very recent experience. But I want to go back a bit, about 10 years backwards, just to see what happened before the storm. So to understand how and why we could really boost digital transformation uh, in such a short time, how, how and why the trust has to be, I would say how the trust was even forced uh, in our everyday uh, life uh, by using the technology. And then parallel, we will also explore and discuss a few of the questions, what's happened in the storm, but I definitely would like to give you some of my thoughts <coughs> about what will happen after. Obviously, this, you cannot split the time in such a rigid way that you say from today until tomorrow, this is before and after. So the, the things and the topics which I will cover are having a, going in a parallel universe some way, <coughs> but uh, I'm very sure that you will be able to, to understand the flow which uh, I would like to share with you. And uh, those who know me, I try, uh, not try, I enjoy showing them my thoughts in the visual stories. So I also brought some of those stories to you just to make you understand how I see this change and the digital transformation during this, uh, I would say in a decade or so. So let's start going backwards and let's see what happened. So I don't know if you were recall, but a uh, couple of, um, a bit more than 10 years ago, we had been facing a financial crisis. So I'm sure you have done a lot of courses on this. You have learned a lot of discussions. But one thing that has changed is elementary. And the, the, the driving force if the, of our new era has changed. So until 2008, we could really state that the driving force uh, across the globe in the business was primary money, so the financial. financial. Then we had the crisis. And every organization stopped in a couple of years in the period of chaos. Chaos is a Greek word, by the way, so it's uh, very easy to be pronounced. I'm very struggling with uh, words which are not kind of having Greek roots, but chaos is one of my favorite wor words because when there is a chaos, you can explore a lot of opportunities. So you don't have predefined steps to step in, but you can really uh, be innovative and find new ways uh, for the future. So what happened then? So after 2008, for four or five years, many organizations were struggling to find the future of their business. And then sooner or later, we, uh, it could be clearly drawn out what is the new driving force in the future? What do you think? So if just shout or type quickly, if you have any thought. Well, if I need to ask you, what is the driving force today, the elementary driving force today, what would you say it is if it's not the money? What do you think? Teresa, you are on mute. Maybe you have any thoughts on this. 
not. Of course, I have thoughts. <laughs> okay. What do you think is a new driving force in this uh, current era? Security, uh, personal security, personal comfort, well-being, something like that. Uh, the things you say are uh, the out. Obviously, I understand why you say those. So the, the driving force is an elementary something. So it's a small element. So as it was money, money is driving everything. And I, uh, but when you say security, probably because nowadays you have you are more exposed individually. So your individual data are more exposed. So I even said the answer. So the new driving force in the following era is data. So we have stepped in the so-called data-driven era. Every organization is leveraging data to for business advantage to run their future, the, the, to transform the way how they do business. And uh, if when we meet back in Poland sometime later, maybe we can even discuss and I will prove you that the driving force was always changing through time. It's not only that it changed now, but it has changed uh, hundreds of years ago, several times already. So we have, we, all of us have been born in an era when we, uh, we thought that the money, the financial is a driving force, but now we, we were lucky enough to, be, to, to live through this chaos and uh, moment of time and step and enjoy, I would say, let's be positive, okay? So let's enjoy this new era where the driving force is data. <clears throat> so how, how his, this has changed the business, how we do business, let me show you with an example. This is one of my favorite examples. I use puzzle pieces. And with the puzzle, I would like to show you the, the what, how business is changing. So we have moved in the data-driven era now 10, 15, 20 years ago, we didn't have access to the data. So in order to be able to take a good decision on business level, you need data, obviously. So without data, you cannot take a decision. So before we move to this new era, we didn't have access to our data. So we, the, the, we had to take decisions like this. So we had like consider like the puzzle pieces are upside down on the table and you have to take a decision. It's very difficult as a business decision make her a leader to take a proper decision upon that. So what we have been doing that time, so we have been uh, turning up and upside some of the pieces, and then we make assumptions. So we saw in a piece, you see now in this picture, some pieces with different color. So what you, in the business uh, uh, metaphor, so what you would do, you would take assumption, you make a hypothesis, and then try to collect as many data as you could. It was historically back, to prove that your assumption was correct. So if this is a picture, <clears throat> if you ask my wife for the picture, she would say definitely this is, is a Labrador. She loves dogs. The colors are there. So that's definitely a, a nice, and beautiful young dog. Me, who, who loves to be in Greece, I would say, no, no, this is a sand from the, the nice sea, the Coast Guard. So I'm, I'm more than sure that the, the picture itself is a Greek sea. Uh, uh, with the waves and all these things. So then what you do in the business level, you start proving your assumptions. <coughs> so the <coughs> thing has changed and now we are in this moment. <coughs> Is this better? Are, are you able to take any decisions now since you have access to all the data? We have moved to the data-driven era. Every data is available. So are you ready? Are you... Do you feel more comfortable? Obviously not, because this is a big mess. So you have access to all the data, but you don't, you are not able to take your decision. And the tools we have in place now are not really helping us on the level we are expecting them to help. So the technology is evolving, but it has reached to this level. More or less, we are able to put the surroundings, to, to put, create this, the the side of the puzzle, but we are not yet fully ready to see the whole picture. But if you are on business decision-making level, so definitely you are only interested to see the outcome. You don't care how the picture was created, but you care only about the outcome. So the outcome can be totally different from any of your assumptions. <clears throat> In our case, the outcome was something which has also a sea, but also it looks like a dog, but it's a totally different animal. So both of our assumptions were wrong, the, the real data shows a different picture. So you as a business decision maker, leaders, people who want to take, who have to take decisions on daily basis, 
You only care about the picture. You don't care how the puzzle put, was put it together. You care about the outcome, to have the access to your information whenever you need it, to be able to take a decision on the spot, even with your phone, <coughs> phone and, take, and uh, take your business forward. Okay, this is how we want to leverage data. This is what business is expecting, and it's very, very difficult. But don't be, it's not a big problem because it's very, we are in very early stage. So we are in the moment. So if you say that we accept that we have moved to the data driven era, so we can see also something else is changing parallel to our uh, evolution. So in 2011, from 2011, from technology point of view, we consider ourselves that we have stepped in the new technology phase, which is considered to be the cognitive systems uh, era from technology point of view. So as you see here, <coughs> we had <coughs> tabulation back in the beginning of 19th century. Then we moved to the programmatic systems. The technology you have in front of you is a programmatic. It's programmed to be doing what you want. It's a binary <coughs> system. But from 2011, we say that technology-wise, we have stepped to the cognitive system center where we are also have the possibility to leverage cognitive systems for our business decisions. And as you see here in the picture, this is not replacing because the previous technology change was replacing the uh, earlier, it was, so the tabulation will become obsolete, but cognitive system comes on top. So this is, that's one of the reasons why technology and digital transformation is boosting nowadays. And in that sense, <clears throat> the only thing which I would like to take you, to make you remember from this picture is that there is a periodic uh, cycle in this uh, technology evolutions. So you see it's around 50 to 60 years. So we, but that means that if, if you say, if you accept 2011 and we are now 2020, so we are just in the first 20% of the time where we have started leveraging the new possibilities. So that's why that is where we are now. And just to answer you that cognitive systems are not the only technologies which have been driving the digital transformation of our business, but I wanted to show you the scope and the goal, ultimate goal of it. But let me ask you, and this will be our first question, which emerging, or I don't know how you call it, many, they call it differently, but I, I like to call them emerging technologies uh, uh, are driving the digital transformation in your business. So you can go to the poll now in the, which I have put it there. And uh, uh, yes, big data you say, but you can type it in the poll and let's see also, uh, also the results. Big data is here. Obviously big data is the source and the uh, IoT, uh, artificial intelligence. Yes, very good. So we have a lot of technologies which are uh, driving our digital transformation. <coughs> what else, what do you think? I still miss one very important. Obviously, there are uh, many, many technologies. Artificial intelligence is, it seems that it uh, has an impact on you. So many people are, uh, believe that this is, it's obviously not only one, you can type several ones. I still miss the most important, which is, uh, uh, I would say, the base of everything we do. I will tell it so we don't not to lose more time on this. Obviously, cloud computing, so the, the, that ensures the flexibility uh, for the technologies. All these technologies you mentioned here to be to be boosting. The the big why we are lucky enough. So we are lucky enough because of technology evolution. All these technologies have been starting driving the transformation of our business a decade ago. Meaning, but that by today they are mature enough. So that was the main reason why we could use and boost the digital transformation of our business in a couple of days or weeks even. That was the main reason because all of these technologies and the rest which I, I have not identified, but the technologies we are using, I will show you in a shortly some of those more, uh, are on the maturity level which can be applied and be useful for our business meaning that uh, we, we had to force only the skeptical people to move forward because there was no other way they could uh, survive 
by the way, how are they doing business before blockchain? Yes, that's also will be. I would say it will be even more important in the following years as it's a it's an evolutional uh, cycle. It's a bit behind of the other ones. Let's go a bit further and let me ask you uh, concretely about the. COVID situation, what are the most profound changes that we are witnessing from technology point of view? So what have, which technologies has been immediately been adopted in our everyday life uh, due to the coronavirus situation? So you can find several sources <coughs> and some of the things you mentioned are already in this list. But uh, I think the best source is the top 10, which was described in the World Economic Forum in an article which I have uh, highlighted here. And it says that these are the top uh, 10 technology trends that has been not only boosted, but exponentially grown in the, the, during this last 10 weeks or 15 weeks. Online shopping, so uh, it's, 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 it's dramatically changed. So people were, who were being skeptic before, now they have, they have been forced to use the online shopping. Contactless payment. I don't even recall when I had to touch paper-based uh, money during uh, the last two months after. So I only use my phone even. So obviously you do this. For, from business point of view, the remote work, work from home, working from home, that was one of the most profound change during the last week. So we could, I don't know how about you, in, but in our organization, we, we sat down on a Wednesday and uh, I think it was 11th of March and we decided that the whole company should move home. And the day after everybody stayed home and we only let the people come to the office who have forgotten to take the charger uh, to home. So this is, uh, in the, it, would, it could be done immediately. And you see some other changes here. Obviously the list could be endless, but uh, there are some interesting one like uh, telehealth, or online entertainment. So the, the actors, the musicians had also to change the way how they do, how they work, and how they sell their services. So this is really exciting. I don't know how much it feels yet, but definitely robotics and drones have already started in some sense, but obviously not on the same level. But that's something also that will be changing in the near future. So this list is exciting. But this doesn't mean anything. So technology is evolved, it's mature enough, uh, it's ready to be applied, we have been using it. But one thing for sure is that without the technology itself is not enough to change how we do business. So we need to apply uh, new business models, to adapt to new business models by leveraging the technology, by using, so the technology uh, would be considered only enablers. So you can have the cloud technology there, but if you don't change the way how you work, the cloud technology will be even more expensive than anything you do now, for example. That's why I like this picture, that you, you can imagine the impossible that even a wave a rail can uh, uh, fly on the cloud. So you need new type of business models. And this is the transformation which is really happening uh, across the globe. Uh, it, this transformation started before coronavirus situation uh, boosted, before the pandemic. And, uh, but uh, in the, I think the whole situation had boosted this and you, I will show you also some examples. So what is the business transformation now? So we talked a bit about how the driving force is changing, how technology has changed, but how, what is the impact and how the business is changing and I think I will show you a model. I'm not sure if you are aware, probably you feel because you, you are in touch point with many of the companies who already follow this kind of business approach. But I, 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 would, I would like to ask you to think about it, whether you are doing the same or whether you are transforming. And I mean, like, let me give you like a, a map, a navigation map of what kind of areas you will need to explore yourself, your company, your business, how to be transformed for being really future-proof, let's say. Let's see. Let's again historically show how this has evolved. <clears throat> so, so, so our strategy in our organizations were very organization-centric 
let's say, 20 years ago. I don't know if you have, when you studied first uh, level of what you had this high, quarter, quarter fair strategy, you had a five years plan, 10 years plan. So the organization itself was defining how they would like to do something. Uh, after the financial crisis, we realized that we have to focus a bit more on the client. So we have put in the client in the center and we said we are moving, we move to the customer centric economy. So the everything client wants, we are answering the needs and uh, we, we follow that. But we already moved and made the first step beyond that. So we are moving to a world when we can, uh, in, the, in this uh, study, but it's not only, uh, I brought the IBM study because I have direct access to it, but a part of that, uh, many other uh, studies we sh have shown the same outcome that we have been moving now nowadays into kind of everyone to everyone type of economy. When uh, the clients are also part of the system, it's not only that the, the ones who are being served, but they are also part of the system. And the other, other uh, biggest change is that there is an inversion in the way how we do business. So before 10, 20 years ago, we have been producing things and try to sell them. Now we have trans uh, inverse this and first we have to sense what the client want and then respond to the needs as soon as possible to individualize anything we sell, either it's a product or a service. So we have to personalize it, sense the needs and answer to the needs immediately. So this is from business level, the change. The other change and I think this is the key point here, that from technology point of view, <coughs> when Microsoft invented spreadsheet, Word, all these things, we have done the first like digital, digitalized the way how we do business. But in reality, we didn't need much than taking the paper based uh, how we did this and put it in a digital form. That's a digitalization. Then the next, uh, the Decade ago, we started, let's say, doing the digital transformation by adapting the technologies, these emerging technologies which are mentioned in our everyday business, trying to use a bit more the social channels, the cloud computing, experimenting a bit with artificial intelligence and all the technologies you can imagine around yourself. But now is the time when we need to digitally reinvent our business. So this is, it's not enough to, let's say, digitally transform our business because it's like using the technology in a satellite mode, like pretending we are modern. Can you imagine a bank who is, uh, has all the technology in front of the main, uh, still the core banking system, which is the old fashioned uh, green screen technology, uh, uh, 30 years old, or I don't know how old can be even. So we have to digitally reinvent how we do our business. And the question comes then, so how should companies reinvent themselves during and after the crisis? Because obviously during the crisis, many organizations have done, have taken some decisions. For example, we use Zoom, we use uh, Microsoft Teams, we use the, which technologies to use. But after the crisis, we have to go back and check whether the decision we took, immediate decision was correct or not, but be more calm, calm down and digitally reinvent how you do business and think which technologies are the ones which are really supporting your, the future way of operations. And there is also another change of, to think about how to change the business models, how you do the business. So not traditionally like linearly, but how you can change gradually the way how you do business by help, by the help of technology. And the study which I have explored and has been done with a lot of, lot of more than 12,000, I think, sea level people, it, the picture is started drawing down and the picture is falling. And take this as a map. Okay, so this, this would be the map of how the digitally reinvented enterprises are changing the way how they do business. <clears throat> Obviously in the center, we still have the experience, the experience centric. You see a difference, it's not customer, it's experience. 
if we would have been in a discussion in a face-to-face, -face, I would ask you, why do you think, what is the difference between experience and the customer? Why it's not the customer in the focus? The experience is in the center because companies realized, and it was even more important now during the coronavirus situation, that the experience of their employees is equally important as the customer experience. So the experience should be a holistic, not only the clients and you have your servants serving them, but also the, your people, it, you have to create an environment when your people are motivated to work. So they also go through the experience of working in for you, this organization. As you see, the technologies are surrounding this. So these are enablers. And what you do, what companies, the successful companies do, they have, uh, they, they revise the way how they do business by, by defining new business models, looking for new focuses to areas to enable or to, to, to boost areas, uh, money-making areas, which they have never thought before, activating markets, which they didn't knew that uh, existing at all before they re reinvent themselves. I will show you some examples and then it becomes even more clear. The other is that uh, it's not enough to think about how you do the, what, what you do for business, how you make money, but also you need new expertise. So you need new, you, you need talents, but also you need to create, to, uh, to be successful, you have to work in the future and more and more organizations are doing this, they are uh, thinking the future in ecosystems. So they are creating orchestrated ecosystems or becoming partners or members of orchestrated ecosystems. I will show you some examples of key dominant players who are really boosting this and using the, uh, the word of ecosystem on a level which you cannot even imagine. And the last but not least, we should also not forget that we have the technology can enable the new ways to work. Obviously work from home, work from anywhere is the future. So you might even not need so many offices or spaces. Uh, obviously it's good to meet with the people, but in many cases you can observe that there are a lot of job roles which can work quite well, even being face-to-face, uh, -face, without being face-to-face. -face. So two areas where they have biggest uh, uh, advantage of technology is that we have now, as you saw in my example with the puzzle, and based on because of artificial intelligence and a lot of uh, insights from the data, we have actionable insights of our clients, of the way how we do business, of our employees and all, all these things. And also we can be much more responsive. So our operations can boost, can become much quicker. So we can react on the smallest change and we already have patterns how we should solve each problems and become much quicker than ever before. So this is, these are the areas which uh, digitally reinvented enterprises are focusing, but how you can do business successfully in the future is that, and uh, I don't know if you have observed this, but companies are moving, oh, sorry, I had forgot this, uh, Yes, but that's the statement which is obvious. So companies are moving to ecosystems. Ecosystem is again a Greek word, so that's why it's really, for me, it's really uh, explaining the, how it is behind all this. Ecosystem is like a symbiosis. You have to, you work with a partner in not like a, the one is serving or providing services, but you, you co-create value with the other members of the ecosystem. So this should become, in many organizations already see this as the strategic potential to define in which ecosystem they are participating. And the good news is that it's not only one, depending on what you do, you might have, uh, you might be a member of several different ecosystems. This way you can reduce the engagement cost because you might be sharing resources with other members of the ecosystems uh, that you don't need to keep uh, for, uh, uh, for, for long term and so on. And at the end of the day, this generates very, very strong new opportunities by leveraging the, the ecosystem. You might find sources, new revenue sources you didn't thought before that they're even existing. 
Parallel to, parallel to this, uh, I forgot to mention a key important message. So that, uh, let me step back only for the new focus. When we say that companies have new focus, I don't know if you observe, but big and lot of companies have simplified what they do. Uh, they, they changed the focus and they decided to which direction they go. So the focus is very narrow and very deep. I don't know, for example, let me ask you one question. Do you know in what industry is Philips positioned today? Philips, you know Philips? So if I ask you, think about it, what is the industry where would you put Philips today? Can you talk or type maybe? Whatever you want. I'm very happy to hear you. What industry? Just talk out loud, so don't. Lighting. Lighting, okay. Michal, medicine. what do you think? Medicine. Okay, that's getting closer. So what happened, I don't know if you have heard the story, but it's really a very cool story. And I was so excited. I, I, it happened to, I happened to know the leader of this sales transformation at Philips, and he had some nice uh, presentation to us in the team and the students, uh, with the students. Philips was originated in lighting, originally was lighting. They, Philips was the company who invented LED technology. So they have the IP of LED technology, and once they invented this technology, they stepped out immediately from lighting. This is, sounds nonsense, yeah? It's you, 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 you invent something, you immediately step out from the competition. Teresa said that the Philips is in electronics. Yes, Philips was in electronics. You have the shaving machines, TVs, a lot of things. Philips invented CD. So they had a lot of technologies, which were consumer every time, every day usage technologies. Philips sold everything. They sold everything apart of the things which had to do with healthcare. So today, Philips is positioning the company in healthcare industry. They even moved over uh, in the stock, uh, stocks exchanges in the US. They repositioned themselves from electronics to healthcare industry, and they sold everything else. They sold the even the the core business, which they may be doing before, because they said that, for example, that technology is very easy be, to be produced. Even if you're in your home, you can produce LED lights. So that there is no, no barrier, entry, high level entry barrier for competition. So they decided to move to healthcare, re realign the focus and really follow this picture that we said. So they, said that focus should be narrowed down. We cannot focus on everything and compete of but several battles. So we have to focus on key areas and the new is uh, the, the healthcare. Other companies have taken such strong decisions. Not everybody was so successful as Philips nowadays because we can consider Philips is successful. Obviously they make less revenue from size point of view, but profitability is much higher than ever before. So going back to the previous thinking or thought around ecosystems, if you are a member of an ecosystem, you have to choose your role. And the, the study has shown that this, the companies might be positioning themselves in various roles. And this is, we can observe four types of roles in the ecosystem. So we have the, uh, the role of experience providers. So this, this is the company who is ensuring the experience are closest uh, when the service or the product is produced. We have a, a role for asset providers. This is, I think, the area which was uh, much visible nowadays or during the last years. And I, I show that also in Poland. So I found some examples for you in the next slide. Then we have the process providers who move to the direction that they ensure the end-to-end -end process for producing value from the ecosystem. And last but not least, we have also the so-called platform providers. Let me show you examples and then you will understand much better why we say so. So here are some, some of the generic examples. You might know 
few of them, but not everybody, every uh, organization. For example, they, we say Netflix is an experience provider. So I don't know how, if you are aware of, but Netflix is gathering more than 26,000 KPIs for each of you. I don't know if you use Netflix, but they are measuring everything, anything you do. You stop a series, you step to the next one. You didn't watch this because of the, the picture was changed, and, but you check the same video and then, the, then they use the other picture and so on and so on. So it's an it's enormous lot of KPIs measuring what you do in order to make sure that they can provide the experience and personalized experience for you. We have Under Armour here, for example, they, they have... Uh, they, they were producing or still producing uh, sportwear, but the originally the main focus was to make sure that they, they provide the experience. Two is a well-known for me, but I don't want to discuss all of them, but let me focus on one which I let here is Airbnb. I'm sure you know Airbnb, this one, which is a platform provider, but in Hungary, we have an Airbnb, which is just like a member of the ecosystem of Airbnb. But maybe the big Airbnb is not even aware of what they do. So if you have a flat and you would like to rent it on Airbnb, they come to you and they said, okay, instead of you spending so much time dealing with the guest, cleaning the house, making sure that, the, that you get good uh, evaluation on Airbnb, let us take it, this over. We provide as part of the service. And we take a percentage of your uh, revenue from the guests which you are serving. So you can imagine this ecosystem. So we have Airbnb, who is the platform provider. We have people who have flats and they want to rent them on, on Airbnb. These are also the asset providers in that ecosystem, yes? We have Airbnb, the Hungarian, the different, it sounds the same, but it is only the abbreviation who is the experience provider, make sure that the clients who are taking the flat by using Airbnb, getting the maximum of the experience. So this, I think with this example, you can really understand how the ecosystem mode is really activating revenues, which you didn't thought before. So who would be thinking 10 years ago that, I don't know how old is Airbnb, that you have a flat and you can, by just by an app, you can make money to compete against the hotel industry and so on. And we have other examples here. I brought some from uh, Poland as well. Probably you know all these asset providers. I left here Tata, which uh, I think it's uh, very exciting because Tata is cooperating with Uber. Tata is providing the asset. Uber is ensuring the process of going from A to B and paying. There is a driver who is bringing the car, driving the car, but since in some cases the driver, they don't have their own or cars. Tata said in, I think it was in India, so they are driver, if you want to become an Uber driver, I will provide you the asset and you will pay me based on usage. So how many, how many trips you take, how many clients you can serve, I get my share. And this way they could leverage the cars since they had on stock, uh, and Uber was also uh, making money because more people were driving than even those who didn't have enough money and so on. Again, you can imagine the ecosystem, several players, Tata, driver, customer, Uber. So all these are part of an ecosystems, ecosystem. And the fun part is that sometimes you might not even know that you are uh, having a, a mem another member in your ecosystem. So I have some other examples here, but uh, hopefully by now this is very clear for you. And one thing which is uh, really important that in this new way, how we do business, the ecosystem participation is only valuable if the ecosystem fulfill business goals better than would have been achievable operating outside of the ecosystem. Because it's a risk you are taking. If you become a member of an ecosystem, there are also risks because you need to have the highest level of trust to the other members because the ecosystem members are fully transparent between each other. That's why you have to ensure the highest level of trust and you are looking for value. You are looking for new revenue sources 
then to be more successful than being without being being member of the ecosystem. That's why nowadays uh, many people and many studies say that in this sense, in the ecosystem, the value is co-created. Okay, so as you saw in the examples which I showed, told you before, with uh, Airbnb, with Uber, and the uh, other members of the ecosystem, in these cases, the value is co-created, and even the client, sometimes even the client is member of the ecosystem. So you can uh, provide or gain other benefits just by participating in the specific ecosystem. So this was the part which I wanted to show you and discuss with you, more or less explain to you or show you what are the new business models which companies are following. So those companies who are digitally reinventing themselves. But during the last 10 weeks, and uh, as you, we discussed that many technologies has evolved and artificial intelligence is there and we are stepping in the cognitive era. So many, many people are afraid that technology will replace many of our regular jobs. Let's go back to our poll again. And what do you think? We really technology replace a big portion of our regular jobs in the following years. So now we have entered, we are just over the first period of time and we are moving, the speed is enormous. And uh, what do you think? Will technology replace the, our, most of our regular jobs in the following years? Most of, almost of all of you say yes. It's interesting, this time doesn't come out the Pareto. Usually we have 80-20 rule, that the outcome is 80-20, but now today, more of, most of you strongly believe that the technology evolution it has huge impact in our regular jobs. And that's true, that's really true, because I don't have, a specific statistic which I choose, but I would I made an average of the many, many sources which you can find around this. And that in the following decade, more than two billion, two billion of jobs will disappear or technology will replace them. <clears throat> and we are not talking about only uh, uh, physical jobs, but also uh, uh, cognitive jobs which are needing mentality. Even in some cases, the boss might be replaced. So the leader, so in a call center nowadays, you don't need a leader. You might have an artificial intelligence taking some decisions. So the people who were working in the second level line in a, in a help, center, help desk center might be replaced by artificial intelligence who will tell what kind of actions the person, the guy on the field should take. So that's a big, big, big challenge. But Yes, and we can really state that automation will replace not everything, but many, many of our jobs. <clears throat> but this is not happening only today. So then can you imagine uh, 100 years ago, what kind of technologies were boosting again and emerging that time, and they were replacing a lot of jobs of that time. So let me show you the, my favorite example. I have hundreds of these, but uh, I think one is enough to understand this. This picture was taken in the exact same place in the 19th century beginning, and a bit more than 10 years later on in New York. On the left-hand side, you can see the first car, Ford car appearing on the road, and a lot of coaches with horses were going back and forward. And then 10 years after, you could really, struggle to find the one coach driven by horse in the same location. So technology has changed the way how we live, but also has changed a lot of jobs and the jobs changed immediately. So maybe we needed to have somebody who is taking care of the horse in the beginning of 19th century. And 10 years later, we had people who were taking care of the car. So the jobs are changing. When people ask me what, what should our kids learn, 
I said, I don't know. So may probably most of them will be doing a job which today doesn't even exist. And it's funny, I heard this from my kid. So uh, he was taking, participating in a, joining a new school and they, he, they asked him what you would like to become. He said, I don't know, because the job which I would do might not even exist today. I was shocked, but he, he realized this. So a 10, 12 years old kid realizes that should not be scared of the future because he might be doing a job which today does not exist, but definitely there will be something that he will be able to do. This is one key message here. The other message which I nowadays observe, and I, uh, I think it's really changing, have you heard about the word for talent? So every company is looking to find talents. We have talent acquisition programs. We have talent management in the organization or talent uh, development programs and so on and so on. Even in my previous slide, I showed you that talent is an important key part of the future. Is it, have you considered that, is it really so important to have talents what is talent at all in general? So there was the original article was who mentioned this that the, the word there is a word for talent, war for talent, was mentioned from McKinsey in 1997. But today we can really state that this is over. This is the, the, it's not about the battle, it's not in the, anymore about talent. It's about skills, capabilities, and other, other things. And why? Because if you think in primary technology related job roles, the knowledge erosion has dropped so drastically that it's, if you are talented today in something, tomorrow you, your talent is a, is a waste. You don't need it anymore. Because the knowledge erosion has dropped from the age when we had this horse changing, the, the car was changing the horses. Let's say you were studying in the university and you gain access to knowledge. You could be sure that by the time you go retiring, you can the knowledge you gain in the university is valuable and you can use it. Today, in many fields, this, uh, the, the, the cycle, the knowledge cycle has fallen below two years. So if you learn today something, you can leverage it for two years, but maybe three years from now, it will become obsolete. We have been teaching in the university user experience designing and then we realize that this is not a standalone role anymore. Many organizations have embedded in their everyday activity. So every job role has this part of the user experience element. So we don't have it as a separate knowledge element in the school even. So this is mad, not so when you were our grandparents or our parents, even they studied something and they were relaxed that okay predefined steps, how they will go until retire. And now if there is a kid, he, he might start the university and by the time he finish, he might need to do to learn something totally different. So the, in some areas, the, the evolution is so drastic and that it's really scary. And all, if you put all these things together, this has a huge impact in the job polarization already. And this is an area which I really think that also the current situation has put it a lot of, or touched it a lot. Let me show you what I'm thinking about. So <clears throat> if you put the jobs in a matrix, obviously there should not be a presentation without a four by a two by two matrix. So you can put the job roles in a cognitive compared whether it's a cognitive or manual, or either it requires a routine or it's a non-routine uh, activity, yes? So you can more or less put all job roles in this matrix. So you have the routine cognitive jobs like translator, lawyers, accounting, all these activities. You have, let's say, routine manual, the factory, factory workers, bank, the bank cashiers, or work, people working in the ban. Non-routine but cognitive could be the engineering, logistic, even the data science. It's a non-routine, but still need cognitive, but you can have non-routine, still manual activities, like people working in healthcare, plumping, electric, electrical engineer, and all these things when you have to have also, you, to be clear-minded 
and it's not, not every case is the same as the other one. What do you think before I tell you how this is changing? So many initially, when we first thought that technology will replace a lot of jobs, many people thought that it will replace mostly the manual jobs, as it has done already. I don't know if you have been in a fully automated car factory. It's rarely you can see a person, an individual there. The individual is only waiting if a robot goes down and they go there and fix it. Compared to another factory, I, for example, I've been in Hungary in a factory which is still manually workers, factory workers, and another factory is fully automated. The, it's, the change is huge. In the one side, you see, let's say, 100 people, no, 1,000 people working, and maybe a few robots. And in the other factory, you see, I, there was 1,300 1, robots working. So I was sitting down there, and until I could, my eyes could see, I could see only robots. So this is about the manual jobs. But the bad news is the technology is replacing also the cognitive, those job roles which are requiring routine, and they consider to be cognitive, like accountant, lawyer, lawyers, translators. Obviously, we need some translators, but not on the same amount as we had before. I have a lot of lawyers' friends who are scared because they were, most of the job was just to look for, to match the needs with the, the, the laws. But these things can be done automatically immediately. And there is a huge decline in this uh, required, in the demand from this side. So people are lo really losing the jobs on the left-hand side. But the good news is <clears throat> that on the right-hand side, we look, the, the demand is growing. And the, the, growing, the growth is huge. It's above 60%. Obviously, the two, the two bubbles or the, the two uh, groups are not equal. We still have more people doing routine jobs. But one thing definitely that we change in the future, that most of our jobs, we move from routine to the non-routine side. And we have to do something which is, is not like repeated. That's why also we have to refresh our knowledge continuously and to be able to learn new things in the, on a day-to-day basis. And this is the moment when I was thinking, yes, and when I look for new people in my team, what, can, what should I look for? Should I look for experience, the knowledge they bring, or should I look for the attitude? So if the next, the last, oh, I think I have one more, but this is the next one, the poll, what do you think? What is more important, the experience or the attitude? When you build your team, what would you look for mostly? So to find experienced people there or to have people with a specific attitude? Yes, feel free to vote, so to express your thoughts. But I think this team today is 100% club. Oh, we have somebody who says it's different. Yeah, this, is, this should be the correct. The 80-20 rule is usually what comes out, but we have more and more people. So obviously experience is a very important thing, but nowadays it seems that this is changing and more and more leaders believe that attitude could even bypass or overpass the experience because you might not be, as Einstein said, you cannot solve problems with the same way how, the, how they were invented or created. So you need new ways. And how to do that, you definitely need to change <coughs> what you look when you, for example, onboard people. 20 years ago, we have been looking primarily with most of you, even when you started career, like uh, IQ test. You had to do some IQ tests and you, have, you were above a percentage, maybe you get an extra point. Then uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, and even nowadays, many organizations are checking about the EQ, their emotional intelligence and all these things. But more and more organizations have started exploring a new, the, the so-called LQ, which stands for the learning coefficient, but how good is the individual in reshaping the knowledge to, to learn new things and uh, how is this, 
an attitude of learning is, is an attitude of learning there. And more and more companies are looking for this. My statement is that definitely attitude is more important than experience. So you have to be brave enough. It's good to have experience, but without, so can you imagine somebody who has a huge experience and the attitude is negative, you, they will not do anything. But somebody who has a positive attitude might fight until then to find solution for the problems or to, 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 to think about something out. Dorotha said, Dorotha, I don't know how it's pronounced. It's hard to change the attitude and you can gain experience. Yes, that's, that's really true. So experience comes with time and the, the bad experience is also an experience. Changing the attitude, it's a hard job. So if you are a leader, how you can influence your people, for example, in this field, which I mentioned here, how you can influence your team to start learning new things. That's, it's enormously, it's a huge, I don't know about you, I'm, I'm leading sometimes people who were working in the same area for 20 years. Knowledge erosion, all the things which you mentioned today, how you can teach or show them that uh, they need to learn new things because there are things which they knew they, which they have experience in might not last long. And yeah, that's a very good question. And I would say not question what you stated, but it's a, it inherits a question that how can you really change the attitude? Yeah, that's a tough, tough one. It's, it's, it needs a lot of, lot of work. And I will, I will give you one, one of my thoughts on this. So yeah, let us see it now. So in order to be able to change the attitude, but also to do to, to develop the trust. You need to establish a culture of trust. So I think trust is the base of uh, many things. But the, I found a very nice article at Varton recently shown that being vulnerable by trusting in your employees can be a start of positive relationship and improved employee morale. Yes, incentives. <clears throat> Incentives is relative when you say that, because incentives can be money, for example, but is money a motivator? Depends, maybe it's for some people, yes, for some other, no. I had a colleague who got a, an offer for doubling his salary and he still stays, decided to stay because he realized that there are so many things he can still learn here in the team that he, he can uh, get better salary later on, but he now is in a flow mode. He's motivated and his morale was on the top. So he stayed, decided to stay with the team. So for example, I mentioned one team is also can be, uh, yes, and opportunities, good point, Pavel, there, that uh, incentives can be various. Uh, opportunities to, to prove and to test themselves, to, to be able to develop the experience, to be able to, de to use their attitude to learn new things. So that's very cool. But the, my question focus primarily of, uh, are you ready, for example, if you are leaders, are you ready to expose your weaknesses in front of your team in order to earn their trust? Because if you show vulnerability, it's, then you are exposing. So you are taking some risk. Is this a really a risk you are taking? Are, are you really ready to, to expose this and, uh, and, and show weakness in front of your people? Is this good or bad leadership attitude? I don't have the answer. Obviously, I would say, yes, I should. As a leader, I, I'm not... Uh, Unvulnerable. I don't know how it's a different. I, I, I'm not. A, I, I also have weaknesses. If I expose them, that's also part of the, the game. But this is personal. But generally, this is one of the questions which uh, me and some other leaders, which we have started discussing and exploring. There is not a good answer, but definitely the current situation has forced leadership into the form that they need to increase the level of trust to their employees and back and forward. So also the employees are trusting uh, also the people. Okay, Dorothy. Uh, you can also share your thoughts, Dorothy. 
Dorota, and also tell me how should I call you because I don't want to call you wrong. No, no, no it's it's correct, and you should okay. know it because it's a. Uh, uh, my name comes from Greek. Okay, Dorothea. Dorothea. Oh, I, I, yeah. That's easy for me, Dorothea, <laughs> present, present of God. So. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, there are some. Uh, um, there's an interesting research on that by Brenna Brown. Do you know her? No, I'm. Yeah, she's an American psychologist, and uh, she uh, her last book is called, I think, Brave to Lead or something like that. So okay. she's done a lot of research on vulnerability and uh, leaders and how brave, uh, I mean, what, what does it mean to be a brave leader? Yeah, so you should show some weakness um, if you are, if you want to gain trust of your team, yeah. Yeah. So this is interesting to uh, you, you know to to read uh, an interesting read, but obviously it also depends on the culture of a company or a country, because um, this can be also perceived as something. Yeah, as you said, weakness. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Definitely. Yes. And the, that's the article which I have found here. You can find it there. It is. It's saying that you have to really show your weaknesses as well, in order to increase the cultural, the positive morale in the organization. And really, this is really exciting because the, the current situation is forcing us because I don't see my employees how they work. I need to trust them. I can only see maybe the results. I don't, so that also from leadership point of view, but backwards as well. Is, there, uh, is somebody putting enough efforts to work from home or they are just pretending to work from home? So that that's, the trust is is going. That's why I said trust in the digital world is a to totally new thing that we need to learn, both from employer but also from employee side of uh, point of view. Generically, in a team, how we can establish this trust, how we can establish the culture of, of trust. This is one of the biggest challenges uh, nowadays. Yes, thank you for. Uh, maybe you can if you type the name in the chat so people yes, can also we'll check do. the book. And uh, let's turn to the last uh, question, which we would I would like to raise to you, is that by now we have explored uh, how be on business level, but let's go down to the individual level. What do you think? What, what kind of skills will we need in the future to survive in the future workplace? Which is, the whole atmosphere, the whole environment is changing. What kind of skills? And in this case, you can type your thoughts, but also vote. So it's like we can create an order as well by voting to each other's, uh, if you put there, a skill. Also, you can vote to the others, uh, one, to other ones. What kind of uh, skills will help you survive in the, in, in the future workplace? What do you think? OK, it's working. <coughs> Adaptability, yeah. Flexibility, twice, yeah. Mm -hmm. Communication skill. It's funny, no, that uh, I didn't mention soft skills. I just mentioned skills. And most of the skills you have put it here are soft skills. And really, that's really true, that uh, we need to have soft skills for the future that we might not be considering important until now. Critical thinking, logical thinking, it's totally different. I don't know if you are, it's clear for you, but the one is totally different to the other. Previously, we had a course in the university, critical thinking, and then, then we sit down and we said, guys, we don't need it. to have separate course on this. Every course should be in boosting critical thinking. That's that should be part of this. Uh, yeah, analytical skill, that's, you, since we have the data in place now, we have to have more, also new kind of skills, how to see the data, how the data talk, are talking to us, but do we really understand what they are saying? So can we really take good decisions based on the data that we, we have access to? Oh, thank you, that's a, that's a very good list. So let me show you the one list which is a, 
uh, was in the, <coughs> one of the sites which I found and I really enjoyed. I fully aligned with this. So you have find most of these, which are here. But uh, let me, apart of those which are listed, let me tell you which is my favorite. My top favorite skill today, when I build my team, when I look for somebody to join our team or, or whatever, is number seven, it's curiosity. <clears throat> All the others are also important, but I, I, I have a feeling and I'm exploring this and even testing this, that curiosity is a skill. It's very difficult to develop it, but if somebody has it, it, it can really take him or her to, to solve anything, to, fi to find the way out of any maze uh, as, as challenging as it is, as, as, as you can imagine. So curiosity is a very important skill. And I don't know, can you develop curiosity? <laughs> it's difficult. It's, it's like, for me, it's like going back to the childhood. So when the child asks you, what is that? Why is this this way? Why, 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 what, what, what? So this is like, put, put yourself in your child's shoes and ask questions. Be curious because then you can learn. And learn quicker and, and apply the things you learn on, uh, in your job. So you see here many of the others like adaptability, flexibility, and the list initially didn't have the agility in it, but I put it agility as a separate form. Because personally, I think agility is not equal to adaptability or to flexibility. It's something different. And unfortunately or not, in many cases nowadays, agility has even become a wrong, misinterpreted uh, skill. But still, I believe it could be a very important one. Let me show you with, and this would be my closing story for you, uh, how, with a metaphor, with a story, how I see uh, what is agility, what is agile, what is to be agile. If I ask you, are you agile? Everybody will say, yes, I'm very agile. Okay, but what are the skins you have to have to be agile? So let me ask you a very simple question. Who is more agile, a zebra or a lion? See some of you smile. Those who are on face, with face are smiling and thinking. That's a difficult question because most of us initially will think, oh, so, it's obvious, it's a lion. The lion is a team player. The lion has, uh, it's very energetic. The lion is a hunter goes for every opportunity. The lion has a lot of energy. Has, uh, and all the things which you can imagine as uh, agile skills or capabilities or uh, elements of agility, you can find them in the lion. But you, we forget some negative part of the lion. So if you see the lion in reality sleeps eight, 20 hours out of 24, for me, that's not an agile approach. So if, you are, if I have an employee who sleeps all day and doesn't act, it's, it's not good. It. The male lion gives the floor to the ladies. So ladies, please go and hunt. If you hunt something nice, I go and grab it and take it over by power. So that's, again, not an agile, not a really teamwork uh, part. So the ladies are teamworking, but maybe the males are not. I don't know. So but you can understand that the lion also has negative uh, uh, skill sets. So we cannot say that the lion is uh, more agile than the zebra. Okay then, but then the zebra isn't more agile, obviously not, because the zebra is really aware, the awareness is enormous, so they continuously look around whether the lion is coming. There is a real teamwork, they, they, they team up, they protect the small, <clears throat> they can run infinitely, they stamina is endless, so they run until they die. If the, if the lion is hunting, yes. But obviously we don't say yes, but, but in this case, there is a huge but. The zebra is an absolutely reactive animal. So it starts run only when the lion comes. So if you are doing the, your business and you, you cannot start doing it when something is happening or there is a force. Obviously that's the biggest change in the last 
weeks that the coronavirus has forced all the zebras to become more agile. Those who were just looking around, waiting for digital transformation, they had to do, otherwise they do, could become obsolete. So the zebra in reality is not a team player because those who are ahead, if they look back and the lion catch the weakest, they are happy that they survived the day. So that they don't never go back and okay, let's go and help a fellow not to be eaten by the lion. So this is not again a teamwork activity. So the way how you can imagine what is a real agile skill set is one student said, okay, why don't we combine the two? Yeah, so let, let's make friends, the zebra and the lion, and then both will be dying from starving because they cannot eat. <coughs> so it's not, the, not fair enough. This is not the way how you could combine the skills, but the way how you can combine the skills, it has to be um, gradually, it should be part of your uh, skill set. So you have to become a zebra lion, or I don't know why, how you can say this. You take all the agile skill set from both animals and you exclude those which are uh, in, in, in prohibiting you to become real agile. How you can do that? So this. Many people ask me, okay, Achilles, that's easy, nice story, very thank you. How we can transform ourselves on the individual level? And this will be my last slide. So we discussed now on global, on business level, on ecosystems and all the levels. We discussed what skills are needed from leaders and employees, but what you as individual would need to do to start your transformation. I don't know if you, many of you have finished the school or just current students or maybe future students, but there is a transformation you're going through. So this is your individual transformation. And I think every one of us should need to spend time on reinventing ourselves. And it's not only digital, it's not, that's technical technology, how to use technology. We need to reinvent ourselves <coughs> to redefine who we are. And this is, for example, <coughs> A topic I am personally also dealing for myself because I work in several companies, but I don't know if you have heard about the T-shaped model. Have you heard about the T-shaped model? <coughs> More or less, no? So many organizations said that the people working there need to have a T-shaped knowledge so that they have a, a wide range of understanding how business is doing. So this is the T, the top of the T. But to be a deep expertise, have deep expertise in one specific topic. So that was the past. In the past, all organizations were trying to, to develop deep expertise in specific areas and to, to give the awareness to every individual to have an overall understanding what is happening in the business. I don't think that will be enough to be agile and innovative enough in the future. So you need more. And what uh, I, this is my personal belief, take it or not, but this is how I see how we need to develop in the future. We need to develop a ski set like a Greek pie. So it's two legs. So you have a wide range of understanding of what's happening around in your business. It, but becoming deep expert, to develop deep expertise, expertise, in one area is not enough. You have to develop a second leg, an area which is as far as possible from the one which you are already have developed, okay? It don't, doesn't have to be so deep as the T-shaped model, but it, you have to have two legs. Why? I personally believe, and it has been proven many times in the last few years from students who have very, two expertise in very different uh, areas, that real innovation happens when you can combine those two areas. <clears throat> I had a musician in the school, a musician came here and learned analytics, business analytics. I said, I said, man, you are mad. You're a musician. Why don't you go and play some cello and piano or whatever, compose some music? I said, no, Achilles, come on. I want to be the first in Hungary who has an expertise. I'm not the best musician. I'm not Sting or, or U2, I don't know, but I'm, I know music. I want to become the first who is combining analytics with music. And I said, okay, that's cool. So what kind of innovation do you expect there? 
He said very simple story. You see Spotify, for example, combines analytics with music. Obviously, it doesn't create music, but influencing you or personalizing what music you want to hear. And he said he wants to go to the next level on this. And then that, that, these kind of uh, momentums has proven to me that, yes, we need to find our second leg because innovation happens if you can combine areas or connect areas which have not been connected before, or nobody has thought about connecting these two things together. And I think that's something that all of us should at least think about, because I'm sure you all of us, all of you are expertise in some area. Please spend, drink a coffee just because of me and spend 10 minutes to think about what will be your second leg which you would like to explore, to, to learn, or to develop in the future. Okay? So having said that, uh, yeah, still have some time. If you have any question from the things what I told you, uh, I, I finished my part, so I'm, but I'm curious to hear if you have any thoughts or, or questions to any of the topics which you covered. So as we did, we started exploring what happened in 2008 and after, how technology has started transforming the way our, how we do our business and uh, how now companies are digitally reinventing themselves in this new uh, era, data-driven era, and uh, how coronavirus case has boosted the digital transformation of the business or even on our individual level. And we explore this always from the angle of trust. So how we can trust in the ecosystem, how we can develop trust in the, in the leadership or individual level, and how we need to transform ourselves uh, to be successful or, or to be happy, I would say. I, I don't need more. So to be happy in the future, uh, in, in, our, for, in the following years which are coming ahead of us. Okay. So this is the end of the story. Have you got any questions or any thoughts to share? So we still have time. I'm happy to stay more if you if we, we can boost the discussion here. Any thoughts, any questions, please? Um, that first of all, uh, Achille, if I may just say, um, first of all, I, I enjoyed your presentation a lot and and uh, we didn't plan actually to be to stay all the, the lecture and i stayed and and uh, uh with you know uh, with, a, with a with a great great interest i i i was listening to what you just said <coughs> um well my first thought is that simply uh, many things are happening much faster than before and simply, you know, we have to adjust to uh, to it. Uh, I don't, you know, I never been, you know, philosopher in a sense. I'm I'm an engineer, <laughs> so um, I, I I observe uh, all these things in a sense that um, they always were like that. Yes, and I have a picture for you. I, I had it one slide as a backup. Let me show it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I really have this up. This is that because of how technology continues. We did talk about this with Pavel before, so it's absolutely aligned to that. I had this slide. I was thinking to put it in or not, but I think based on what you ask is that technology continuously increases the speed, the doubling, doubling the curve of right. our collective cognition. Obviously, this is again, it's a, it's a story. It's, you cannot prove it, you can, but you feel it. Yes, this is what you said. You feel it. So, for example, our collective cognition across the globe, in the year of steam, in the age of steam aging, when it was uh, first appearing, it took about 150 years to 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 spread the knowledge and to double, dupli, duplicate the knowledge across the globe. The Second World War was a booster in some sense because there was there were forces to against or pro something. That was the, 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 the collective cognition across the humanity, across the globe, was decreased in 25 years. Uh, I changed this a bit because this, this slide is few years already, but 
Today, or a few years ago, it took us two years to duplicate the knowledge. So if, imagine you are a doctor today. The, the knowledge which is generated across the globe is duplicating every uh, 24 months. In order to be aligned, to be up to date with the knowledge, you need to spend 29, 29 hours of reading if, to stay ahead, to be in the niche of the doctor, in the specific area, not everything, just to read the new articles, the new findings about the area which you are uh, working in. It's enormously, it's impossible. But with the help of technology, we can also boost the way how we learn. And that's because of that, maybe in the future, the collective cognition will be doubling in a few days. So it's not only years, it can be down to days. And I had a question from students saying, saying that Achilles did the pandemic situation happened because of technology evolution. Because as you said, we speed up the world. And in some sense, it really happened because of that. So maybe 20 years ago, if it, the same uh, uh, coronavirus was appealing in, in China, we would never even heard about it. it. And now you can see it was, let's say, beginning, end of December when we first appeared. And uh, the, in the February, it, we, we, we announced, March, we announced pandemic. Pandemic means, it's a Greek word, sorry. I, for me, it's a, it's a negative. I, I always listen to the root of the word, what is behind. Pandemic means that it involves every individual across the globe. Pan, demos, demos is the, all, all people in the, and that's happened in three months. Can you imagine that? How this could happen in three months? Because, People are traveling back and forth on between countries uh, on so quickly and often. How they can do that? Why we have low cost traveling? Because of technology evolution in some sense, because 20 years ago, the cost of travel just to book a flight was the cost was let's say 100 euros, 100 dollars. Today, the cost of booking a trip because of technology has gone down to a couple of cents. That's, and also we can optimize the flights. We can, it's a, that's why we could uh, better monetize the resources, the assets, because of technology, because of that we were traveling more. And it was only by chance that it was a New Year's, New Year's Chinese New Year at the time when coronavirus was boosted. So the, in three months, the whole world was shut it down because of technology evolution in some sense. But also on the other side, because of technology evolution, we can fight commonly collectively against it. So, so quickly never people has, or the doctors have explored, exposed, not exposed, explored what is happening, how things are changing, what to do against it, how to protect, how to educate the people to be protected and so on and so on. So it, I say, if you increase the speed and take it to your business, if you increase the speed of your car, you need to grab the steering much better. So because the smallest problem can take you off road. And this is happening nowadays. So the, the, for me, this is scary, but also at the same time, it's very exciting. And I, I fully agree. We are looking ahead an exponential growth of technology evolution and the impact on the global uh, generally. Yeah. Any other thoughts, people? Hi. Okay. A last point uh, from my side is that I use the word, word uh, to be humble or humility. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, we have a tendency that we, you know, can learn about everything and, you know, be precise and control and da da da. And it, it's so far from it. This comparison to the speed and to the control of the steering wheel is a very good one. But simply, we have to be uh, really, you know, careful in 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 uh, judgments and and forecasts and all that stuff. So uh, I think it's a great experience to you know from from this sort of crisis or well this story from you know coronavirus and. and and the consequences of it. So that's that's another thought. I generally think, Achille, that you should actually write a nice 
a book. It, it, you covered so many issues and in a such a you know, consistent way that you know jump from one subject to another in a you know elegant smooth way i encourage you to to write write something that people could sort of uh, refer to and the last point about this pie uh, concept if you discover that i think it, it, it's if it's you know it's a original uh, you know uh, it it really sounds sounds so uh, you know inspiring uh, in the fact that it's really these two legs of pie you know have one is straight and another one is a little, a little bit sort of uh, bended uh, so so one can be stable but another can even go deeper anyway this is a fine thing inspiring elegant and and very nicely delivered delivered um, webinar. Uh, be very happy to to have other opportunities to to cooperate with you. We will see what the future will bring. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I was telling to the people yes. who were joining earlier that my course, which I teach in your university, is a soft skill development. It's enormously difficult to do it online, so we have to look for a time slot when I can travel and we can meet personally there. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you for uh, being with us and uh, also sharing your thoughts and using the poll. I think it was also a good tool to be used. I like it. Yeah. And uh, I hope you enjoyed and uh, I hope I made you think at least about the pie or some, anything else. So we discussed a lot of things. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Very inspiring. Thank, thank you. you. It was great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dorothy.